Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 18th episode of By the Bywater. Great to be back with you as always. We hope that if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, and especially maybe over on the coast that Jared and I are at, you are not currently (laughs) dying of the heat, because that's kind of what it feels like. We just spent five minutes venting about that and other things that we all know. Everything we have said before is all true. (laughs) Everything (laughs) about what is going on with the stupid year. And if we beat it into the ground, one, we hope you'll agree with us. And two, we've said it before. We'll say it again. Everything. Vote appropriately. Black Lives Matter. The whole nine yards. But let's talk about something happy. Let's talk about something good because one of us has got themselves engaged. Hurrah for Oriana. Yay. Yay. I knew I knew he was the one when uh, I can't remember which holiday it was, but he he wrote a card and he tried to write I love you in Tengwar. <laughs> that was he is Leo. You know, he has read Lord of the Rings, loves the movies, but is not not a huge Tolkien guy. But uh, that was that was when I knew. So <laughs> thank you guys. That's so right, cool. Yes, and made the effort. That's good. You you plighted your troth. You were standing below a tower, and you came up and sang. <laughs> that all happened, right? I I, I trust this. Nightingale singing, mm, something yeah, like yeah. that. <laughs> Stars wheeling overhead in midsummer. One could go yep. on. <laughs> 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 Wandering where the where the where the flowers grow. Anyway, yep. uh, <laughs> so with all that in mind, congratulations again. Uh, wonderful news. And again, we've done all the venting. Let's get into some things uh, that are more you know. That's still news, but a little more along what we're talking about here. And there's not much to report, but we do have some. Please, Jared, take us into what news we have for this time around. Yeah, so work on the Amazon TV series in New Zealand is uh, continuing, um, though there was a small emergence of COVID in Auckland that has led to restrictions on gatherings of more than 10 people. So the focus mostly continues to be on pre-production and other preparation. Uh, There's still been no more formal news beyond that. And in a tweet in mid-August, executive producer and key writing room member Jennifer Hutchinson explicitly stated on Twitter that, as is common practice, she won't be sharing anything either. Uh, Mm. and to look for official press announcements only. So for that reason, one further bit of supposed casting news is unconfirmed. Uh, Kaya Scodelario, an English Brazilian actress, flew to New Zealand for an acting position, and rumor has it that it's not only for Amazon's production, but that she could be playing Calabrian, Mm. uh, you know, Elrond's wife and Arwen's mother. Otherwise, there's nothing to report beyond Orlando Bloom saying he'll be interested in the end results, and Hugo Weaving clearly noting that he is done playing Elrond, (laughs) which makes sense (laughs) for a lot of reasons. He is done. He was very clearly done. I think he said something, I think the language was something like, I think we're all, all of our team is just sort of, you know... (laughs) We're a little tapped out. Yeah. And also, you know, you know, it's a weirdly logical question, of course, precisely because, as we talked about before, uh, Elrond and uh, Galadriel and Sauron are kind of your three gimmies for the series one way or another. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to put uh, Hugo and Kate into a time machine, you could try and make it work. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so. Well, Kate's ageless. She is. She actually is. She may actually be an elf herself. Uh, I'm so sorry for the rhyme. Um, <laughs> but... Hugo Weaving, like... He's doing the whole fine line thing. Yeah, he looks... I mean, don't get me wrong. He looks amazing, Mm -hmm. um, but he does look... He's uh, definitely aged. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah. which is great. He's allowed. I don't know. But yeah, no, there's there's not much more to add from that. And frankly, that's fine. Uh, You know, if anything, they should be concentrating on making sure this new outbreak doesn't go too crazy. And Boone checking the updates, it sounds like they've got a pretty reasonable focus on what's there. So crossed fingers, things keep going. But it's just a reminder, yeah, you know, the best laid plans. We'll just see where this all goes. So (laughs) and uh, and as for Scotelario, if she is playing Calabrian, uh, she's appeared in things like uh, one of the Pirates of the Caribbean films, hopefully one of the good ones. I can't remember. (laughs) Well, the odds are not great at that. Yeah. And uh, we'll see. You know, if that's the case, great. But again, of course, since nobody knows, and as Hutchison said, there's like no telling, you know, (laughs) we'll find out one day. But that really uh, is about it. Again, if there was something more major, we'd tell you. But the only other thing to note is that there's a Lord of the Rings Gollum game coming out, and we just were laughing at the idea. (laughs) 
You go around, you steal fish, you look for a ring, you strangle orchids. What do you do? <laughs> look, I would love it, honestly. I would love it if it was almost like a weird version of Journey, where it's just total emptiness and you're just wandering the ruins of Middle Earth mm-hmm. as this horrible gremlin, just like eating fish. I would, oh God. I would play that game. <laughs> Does this also make Bilbo like the final boss? In my game, he is. In yeah, my game, he is. Right? I like the idea of completely ditching Lord of the Rings narrative entirely, and it's all about you know, Gollum getting revenge, basically assassinating you know, Or I guess Frodo. Hobbit. Sorry, I said Bilbo. I don't know why I was thinking only of The Hobbit. But, like... No, I love the idea of, like, th- that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your final thing is Gollum breaks into Rivendell and <laughs> confronts Bilbo at long last. <laughs> Wait, let's scrap the rest of the episode. Let's talk about this. Yeah, <laughs> yes, right? exactly. Let's just plan that out. <laughs> so uh, if you're a gamer out there and you really want to play that game, it's been announced. There's a trailer. Have fun. And <laughs> that's all we're going to say. So <laughs> with that nonsense out of the way, let's get to our topic. Let's get to our subject. And it is Jared's choice this time around. So please, sir, take it away. It's time for my introduction. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, is that how we're going to play this game? <laughs> Podcast over. I, yeah. I swear, that's the only one. I swear. Um, okay, I, I shouldn't, but it's the only one that I thought about beforehand. Mm. It was perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> so, Ents. Um, so, my first encounter with Ents. Uh, picture it. Let's do some scene setting. 1999, maybe 2000. Um, all of those little puckachucks are crowded around my mom, and she's reaching the two towers and mispronouncing Gandalf as always. She always says Gandalf address, or Gandalf. It drives me nuts. Mary and Pippin have just escaped the orcs, made into Fangorn. They get to the top of the little hill. The sun shines, and one of them says it almost makes them like the place. Tragically, this anecdote won't involve me doing an impression of my mom's Treebeard voice, but let me just say it added to the surprise <laughs> when Treebeard shows up behind okay. them. Okay. There's a lot of, it just it just shows up. He's just suddenly there. There's a lot of great things about Ents to talk about, but the biggest thing for me is that Treebeard and the Ents in general were just as much of a surprise to Tolkien as they were to, like, little me at my mother's knee. Mm-hmm. Um, when they're mentioned in his letters, it's always like, I don't know where that came from. Maybe a subconscious <laughs> desire to see Burnham would come to Dunson. I don't know. This, like, he's always talking about the tale grew in the telling. It's that kind of moment. Mm-hmm. Back up and touch on what they are. If by some miracle you're listening to a Tolkien podcast about having read the books or seen the movies or have been living under a rock since 1950, I don't know what it was. So Ents are Shepherds of the Trees. The name comes from an old English word for giant, but the word Ent has nothing to do with trees, and it sounds like he just you know, wanted to use an old English word, because <laughs> that's Tolkien. Very. Uh, they resemble trees, too, I guess, but the description in the book makes it seem more like they're humanoids with tree-ish characteristics rather than, like, <laughs> treeoids with humanish characteristics. They used to be a lot more widespread. They're actually some of the oldest living beings in the Legendarium. Treebeard himself is supposed to be the oldest creature alive in Middle-earth. Believe me, I'm leaving aside Tom Bombadil. Um, and the forest that they, you know, heard used to stretch over a lot of the continent from Fangorn in the, you know, in the book all the way to the present location of the Shire, which is, you know, most of the map. Mm-hmm. They're also, at the time of Lord of the Rings, a single gender race. All the women, you know, the Entwives, are gone. And that's a whole thing we could talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> the biggest role they play in the story... Um, of course, is the destruction of Isengard. This is obviously really important in plot terms, but it has this this energy to it that isn't entirely present in some of the other big set pieces, like the Battle of Pelennor Fields is kind of like a battle that happens. Like, the Ents more or less represent the power of nature itself, and it's really significant that that's used to counter Saruman's industrialization and not a whole lot else. And this ends up bleeding backward into Silmarillion, since they were a spontaneous on-page creation. He had to add them into the earlier legends. Mm-hmm. So there's a bit where Yavanna, you know, the Vala of growing things, finds out that her husband, Aule, has made the dwarves, and she's so pissed <laughs> because it means the destruction of the forests. So she pushes Manwe, and by extension, Ilubadar, or God, to create the Ents as protectors of the trees. So the Ents are an expression of rage, I'm tempted to say. Even though they're really mellow and quirky for all of their like on-the-page appearances, because you know the part with Isengard's destruction is told secondhand by I think Pippin mm-hmm. or Mary or both of them, they're interchangeable. <laughs> <laughs> their function in the world is to be dangerous. It's to defend the woods violently. Um, Oriana, you brought brought up ecofascism in the slack and i'm gonna wait on that because i think that's a whole thing in itself mm. but it's interesting it's so interesting to me that tolkien builds this dark angry rageful power into the forests themselves mm-hmm. and then makes it even scarier with who mm-hmm. mm-hmm. 
these are in the, if you're only familiar with the movies, um, and it's fine if you are. Huorns are tr- sort of like ants that became more tree-ish. Maybe we don't really know what they are. They're the ones, the trees that are moving in the the last march of the ants part. They're very tree-like. They're sort of semi-conscious, but they're capable of moving, and they're just really, really freaking full of anger. They're just like ants that are so incredibly angry that they'll kill anything on two legs. They're just so angry that they broke their own nature. Mm. I should say, I briefly mentioned this, but I should say this only theorized in the book by, I think, Mary. The ants themselves don't want to talk about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The very, like, wharf response to the question. <laughs> the ants are, they're really sad characters, too, to me, anyway. They're fighting a losing fight, and they know it. They, like, they win the battle, but the war is not going to go their way, ultimately, mm-hmm. because there will never be more ants, and it feels like if they're not careful, they'll slip into the horn, like, rage coma, and never quite be a full person again. Like, their, their triumphant moment against the forces of industrialization and pollution is great, but it's preceded and followed by the knowledge that this moment is possibly the last thing they'll ever be capable of, which is... Mm thinking about them in 2020 in the middle of a climate change induced heat wave that's pretty bleak mm-hmm. grim yeah so to, to bring it back to 1999 and you know a tiny me so i'm sitting there like so mom reads it to us and i'm not going to do a tribute voice still but the ends were the first time i thought like oh shoot this might this might turn out all right like oh they're they're, they're off to war the tide is turning this could be great and then followed just a few chapters later by like oh shoot it might not be okay ultimately past the end of the story these people are screwed Mm -hmm. (laughs) my first question really is how do you feel about ants how do ants make you feel (laughs) i love this question the ants i like you can totally tell tolkien was just a guy who really loved trees and he wished that the trees could talk back to him Mm. like in a language that he could understand and that's so cute but i do think what I what was so interesting to me about the Ents was always the Ent wives, the mm-hmm. abs, you know, the absent Ent wives, the missing Ent wives, and they keep saying, like Treebeard keeps talking about how much he, you know, they all searched for the Ent wives and they never found them, and it was like maybe they didn't want you to. Like, <laughs> did you guys mess up so badly that they just don't want you back? Uh, is that what happened here? But it is, it is a sense of melancholy that I think you can find, you know, it's very like English woods. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, it's a place of melancholy, a place of decay rather than growth and, and all of the melancholy that goes along with that. Yeah. And in my case, yeah, this is a really good question. I mean, when, when I first read uh, Lord of the Rings, and you know, you, you get the ants. You know, they arrive, and you're sort of like suddenly Whoa. there. Yeah, yep. and uh, you know, you get Shriver, and it's that sort of like, wow, what am I reading? How do I take this in? How do I conceive of the character? And I remember it was one of those things that I'm pretty good. I'm not uh, on a personal internal level. I'm not talking about compared to anyone else's internal imagination. I'm pretty good at visualizing what I'm reading on the page. Um, You know, call it amateur movie cuts in my head, which itself is an interesting reflection about how over the past hundred years, hundred plus years, the visual language of cinema changes how we read and take in a tale. But that's another thing entirely. It was kind of hard to visualize the ants to a degree. I remember it took me a couple of years before there was an illustration in a fanzine-based calendar. For this is for Beyond Bree, the uh, Mensa uh, Mensa Tolkien fanzine. Yes, I was a member, and uh, and <laughs> that's still fun back. The uh, but the calendar that Beyond Bree came up with one year uh, had a very elegant drawing of a uh, tree bird. It's sort of very long and lean, as befits a sort of like you know not a big stocky tree, a slightly thinner tree, although an older one, with a good emphasis on the eyes. It was a pen and ink drawing, and I thought it was a good way to look at it, and and that gave me an initial sort of grasping of the character where I hadn't quite had it before. But even so, no artistic interpretation of the ants really makes sense to me. It doesn't quite gel because they're that unusual. They're that mysterious. And everything Oriana and Jared have brought up are things, you know, well worth going into. And I don't want to, you know, (laughs) dominate over that. Um, I have some thoughts. Uh, I suppose the thing I will bring up for now, and there's more concrete things I'll discuss in detail later, would just simply be the fact that yeah, that sense of that sense of anger, that sense of un- unusualness. But there's something else too, and there's a sense of ancientness. And I want to throw mm-hmm. in uh, that uh, while the ancientness by default is there, 
It's an interestingly anthropomorphic sense of ancientness, by which I mean, this is how someone, you know, like us, a human, can, you know, sort of symbolize a power of nature. Um, maybe more than any other species necessarily in the entire uh, in the entire uh, legendarium. Yes, there are you know the ultimate spirits like Manu of the air, Oma of the waters, etc. But you could say that this is something more you know grounded. You're someone you're actually you know conversing with, talking to. And I bring this up because uh, a another podcast I'm listening to. Hello, other podcast called Tides of History, uh, hosted by a fellow named Patrick Wyman. He's been uh, spending the last few episodes on status of prehistory, and his most recent episode was basically talking about the last sort of black last of the Ice Age before modern times, the Holocene, and noted that what we tend to think of as ancient Europe does not look the way it does. Rather than it being this huge forested landscape, it was, in fact, something close to a grass-like steppe, almost arid. Mm -hmm. Forests are fairly new. Those type of things are fairly new simply because, you know, a lot of the water was contained in the ice. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, weather patterns were different, other things were different. So it's this interesting impression that we have of like, you know, forests that have lasted from the primeval times, which is very much part of the uh, language of the mythology Tolkien created. But it's actually our perception of ancientness. It's kind of an interesting factor. And that's just sort of an unusual thing. It's how we vest something into what has been around forever. And in Tolkien's case, he vests it, sure, in the mountains, sure, in the other things, but he vests it very specifically in the trees. And that's an interesting perceptual choice that doesn't necessarily reflect reality, but such as creativity, such as how we read the world, and such as how we view things through our own lens. And I'll stop there. Speaking of prehistoric Europe, there's a really interesting article that I read recently specifically about cultivation in ancient Europe, mm. where after the ice receded and the climate was changing, the Neolithic or paleo, probably Paleolithic people that lived there their staple food was hazel nuts and other things like that. Mm. So um, a lot of the forests of old Europe mm. are actually the result of people planting their staple crop. Mm. So this is a little separate from ants and primal stuff and things like that, but it is, Europe has always been artificial <laughs> yeah. in a way. Yeah. So yeah, I just think that's really interesting. It's nothing to do with ants, but I think it's really cool. <laughs> you brought up how they look. Um, how they appear, how they're um, drawn or adapted or whatever. It's really weird that Treebeard is possibly the only character who gets a really thorough description. Oh, yeah. A lot of the other characters are like, oh, like maybe you find out that Faramir has dark hair. Mm -hmm. And then you know Eowyn's blonde, you know Galadriel's blonde, but you don't know like what their eye color is or anything like that. So there's this one specific person who's really thoroughly described, and then none of the drawings of him look the same. (laughs) In the movies, he's very much a tree with eyes. Yeah. It's so weird. It's like they're, it's almost uncomfortable to draw them the way that Tolkien describes them, where they're very human esque with some like mossy features. Mm hmm. And multiple toes, like, well, we have multiple toes, more than, more toes than us. <laughs> They're very uncanny valley when you draw them. I think it's because the the concept itself is so uncanny valley. Like how, you know, the point of plants is they're plants. They're an entirely different kingdom from us. And so the marriage of the two, the mind kind of revolts at the at the idea. So I think that is part of the difficulty is ascribing not just animal characteristics, but specifically human ones, it, you're like, it, it's just, it's really hard to square that circle. Mm-hmm. They're very alien. Yeah. In, in the book, even like elves are, they're comprehensible. They're just on a large, on a longer scale than humans. Dwarves are comprehensible. Hobbits are obviously very comprehensible. We all just want potatoes, but <laughs> the ants are really, really weird. They are so, so weird (laughs) in the, like, even in maybe the older sense of like uncanny or something more going on. There's, there's something to the fact, for instance, that as a, as a, as a species, language is taught to them. Language does not Mm -hmm. originate from within Oh yeah, let's talk about that. (laughs) Yeah, so that's kind of, that's an interesting factor. And again, to explain this out, this is not mentioned in the movies at all, is that, uh, is that uh, Treebeard explains to Mary and Pippin how, how the elves, I forget the exact language, it might be good to to check that, the idea that the elves didn't necessarily wake them up, uh, but the idea that uh, they they were already there, but it was almost like they didn't speak until that moment, which is (laughs) one of those very, you know, 
Tolkien in language, that's a very interesting thing when he has characters who are intelligent who don't speak. That's almost antithetical to Tolkien's race on Tantra on incredible levels. He so, talks about the elves uh, curing them of dumbness, mm-hmm. giving them the ability to speak, either by just talking to them or through elven magic, who knows, they just enable the ants to talk. Mm -hmm. And then the language that is given, the very brief bits of it, you know, you can sort of sense, well, it's a little elvish maybe in tone, but the construction is completely, again, alien, as you Mm -hmm. say, these long rolling. I mean, this is this is not meant to be in a one to one comparison. Nobody take this 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 way. But it reminds me of the constructions of, say, the language of the uh, first dwellers of Hawaii. Uh, the very mm-hmm. long, you know, constructions with a lot of vowels and things like this. How things go on. There's there, again, not an exact comparison. Don't don't quote me on that. You could argue it's more quote unquote liquid sounding, more even more invested in the in vowel sounds. But that is a very a very interesting factor. And the other thing I would add, your point about this is Oriana's point about the alien and uncanny nature of it is the fact that the most telling thing that Tolkien goes in on and literally his characters can't even describe themselves are the eyes, yeah. which mm-hmm. is something that, again, plants don't have. <laughs> so, you know, regardless well, of some potatoes I have uh, in the corner <laughs> there. So as far as we know, they're not looking at us through them, we hope. So but <laughs> but but, you know, that is that is the one thing above all else that, uh, you know, we that uh, Tolkien actually steps out of the story to an interesting little degree and has whoever it is, Mary or Pippin, uh, basically sort of explain in retrospect to someone else, like after the tale is over. But this is dropped in the center of it. It's sort of like, OK, that's an interesting choice. And trying to describe what they are like and being unable to do so, basically conveying mm-hmm. it almost in terms of feeling more than the actual physical description. Very uncanny. <laughs> very, very unusual. Mm-hmm. And yet that gives you it's it is interesting. The This goes more into like writing technique than the ends themselves. But but I do. It does give you a better sense of like the the kernel of entishness, mm-hmm. like the core of their being than simply, you know, saying, oh, they're green, like the green of spring leaves or whatever, um, that extensive wells of deep memory type description that Pippin gives, which I happen to have right next to me, is is ultimately, I think, more effective, um, even if... And maybe because it leaves so much open to interpretation, because, Mm. you know, we all have our own different interpretations of entishness in -hmm. in our minds. Yeah, I kind of want to back up and talk about their language a little bit more. Mm. Yes. You get only a small sample of actual entish Mm. in the book, which is when Trevor is trying to say what he calls the hill. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's, It's this like string of syllables. The appendices briefly mention it as something that, like, even the elves gave up on trying to understand. Yeah. They can't, like, there's so many small distinctions in vowel tone and things like that that it's just untranscribable without driving yourself totally mad. (laughs) So they, they even, even their language is so alien within the context of this fantasy world that nobody nobody can learn it yeah it is you know it is unpronounceable by human the human vocal tract it sounds yeah. like mm-hmm. that's a good way of putting it yeah there there's something you know we've been rightly i think talking about many serious aspects of the the instant characters but i think we should also allow for the fact and this was handled differently in the movie than it is in the book but it's there in the book that the ends are funny unintentionally yeah yeah oh they're so funny but there is there is humor in how he puts it together it's a very careful balance you could argue that that humor is what allows us to connect with the characters whereas if they had been just simply strictly forbidding it would probably be another experience entirely but uh Mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting form of not humanization if anything the humor grows out of the fact that the ants are not human or hobbit or anything else and they're sort of trying to get the grasp of okay so what are you talking about and but uh, there's the fact, for instance, that uh, the story goes, I forget where it's mentioned, it could be in the letters, could be elsewhere, that Treebird's speaking mannerisms to an extent are based on none other than C.S. Lewis. The idea yeah. that, uh, <laughs> yeah. that uh, he's sort of a big, rolling, booming voice and could maybe go on a bit <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and more. I, I, I don't know the full details there. Uh, the scholars could probably say more to that. But there there is a humor in it. There, The Treebird is alien and yet also is of a type. Someone who is 
is uh, is who is an expert on his own grounds, and maybe beyond that is sort of like hmm, <laughs> and is uh, just sort of getting a sense of things there. Yeah, they are sort of scholarly in a way. Even. Yeah, mm. they, like his first response to seeing the hobbits is to go, "Okay, where do you fit yeah. into my worldview? Mm -hmm. You're not in these rhymes, so what's your deal?" <laughs> I have this literal list of every living creature. Yeah, let let it's me know. Very long. You're not in it. <laughs> <laughs> let me know where I can uh, put you. Yeah, and then their first response at Entmoot, their first response to the hobbits also is like. Well, we gotta we gotta fix the lists. Yeah, not, let's fix. Let's not not let's deal with Saruman, but we gotta we gotta update Wikipedia. <laughs> first order of business, obviously. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, why not? It it is interesting too. Speaking of, uh, you know, again, where we where we we tend to read a species through uh, or our culture through one key figure, and this happens a lot in Tolkien, but not universally, mm -hmm. is that uh, we don't see it all through Treebeard's eyes. Treebeard himself makes distinctions between his two, the other two oldest ants like him who are still around and what they're like, and how one has gotten more just sort of like mm, withdrawn mm -hmm. and all that, and then there are some youngish ones around, and the physical depiction of them looking like different trees, looking like different hills. He actually brings in a sense of individuality in mm -hmm. community uh, to them, which is not necessarily always played out elsewhere. It's almost he was attuned to uh, to that sort of thing. Oriana, maybe to go back to uh, your point you've rightly brought up, which is that the ants are incredibly gender defined. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, ants, ants are from Mars and wives are from Venus, essentially, is how that comes down. I mean, let, tease that out a bit if more if you if you want. I find that tension fascinating, the tension between loving nature and, you know, loving so-called untamed nature, which, as Jared pointed out, is seldom actually fully untamed or untouched by uh, the hands of, of humans, mm -hmm. um, whereas agriculture is not fully natural but it is it, i get in some ways they're they're kind of like the ents themselves are are a, a kenning for or a synecdoche i can't remember which one um mm. for you know these concepts themselves uh they they are not fully natural nor fully human mm -hmm. um growing things is natural but uh putting them all in a row or doing little genetic modification is <laughs> is not entirely natural that that tension is so interesting and i actually found like when i was younger i was so invested i thought for sure we would get some sort of closure mm. yeah we would there would be an ent wife somewhere and it would be like oh my god it's so nice <laughs> you're back but it, no <laughs> it's just it's so sad mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. It is really the, the 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 whole gender thing is so so strange because in in his in his letters he briefly talks about the end wives well not that briefly <laughs> <Tolkien>. <laughs> but um, he refers to it as like a male versus female approach to nature but he puts them in quotes hmm. which is a little I mean it's a little odd for somebody who is you know to be honest very invested in gender roles oh, yes. and traditional gender oh, yes. roles <laughs> but he's like say with the quotes make me think like he was just like not he wasn't as invested in it when it came to the ends and it's just i don't know it's such a strange little like slip of the pen here and it's mm. i don't know that i think you know growing up in america in this you know western solution mm. i don't think of agriculture as being a feminine pursuit gardening sure mm -hmm. that's stereotypical i guess it, but yeah not large scale no. agriculture the way the ant wives are said to have done it no so it's, I don't know. I just think that's really interesting as a, a distinction when it's not something that, I mean, maybe it's different in England. I don't know. <laughs> I, but he does have like, it's sort of, it's so similar. Like uh, the story of the Entwives, uh, the, the schism between Entwives and Ents and the schism between Eldarion and Erendis, uh, in that story, it's very, very similar to me. It's mm. the difference between adventure and kind of war and, you know, and in investing yourself in going far away versus home and hearth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Which, 
yeah, it, it is. You see that you you kind of see these themes sort of over and over again. But correct me if I'm wrong. I, I like this distinction, but correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that sort of flipped a bit? Is, aren't the ant wives the one going out or am I wrong? Well, they, they like leave or they want to go where they can have fields, right? right? Like, so they can't be in the forest and the ants just, the ants don't want to be where there's, they're like, no trees only. And mm-hmm. we want to go far afield. Whereas the ant wives didn't want to leave their fields. They couldn't go, you know, far and wide. It's not a perfect overlap, but I think thematically it's sort of similar at the very least. It's kind yeah. of similar to Eowyn's shield maidening and then, oh, I'm going to be a healer and concern myself with herbs and whatnot. The difference, I think, in the worldview of the two ent genders, the genders, is that the <laughs> ents themselves mm. don't want order. Yeah. They want things to just happen. Hmm. But the Ent wives are really, really invested in everything being the way they want it to be. Mm-hmm. Hmm. They're, it's more about domination, like really positive domination, not like, ah, mm-hmm. we're going to strip mine things. But it's a lot more about cultivation, things remaining where they set them, I think is how Tree Root phrases it. They they want to make order out of nature. Hmm. And the, the Ents, the male Ents, just want nature to be. Mm-hmm. I think that to me is is why the gender split here is weird. Not so much because the wives are more domestic, oh, you know they are, but that kind of like wanting control is stereotyped as a very masculine thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas the male ants are like, let's just go with the flow yeah. or or whatever. I don't... Free tree in it. <laughs> <laughs> But but this also, I think this definitely reflects that comment, which we mentioned before, I think fairly recent episode about uh, towards the end of the book where uh, – and we'll get more into Saruman and the, and the ends in a second, I think. Um, but it talks about how uh, how uh, I think it's Elrond who says that, uh, you know, Treebeard, you know, in response to a th- comment to Treebeard saying, saying, yes, but you didn't want empire. <laughs> you didn't want control, whereas to a degree, it seems like uh, the Entwives, you know, do seem to want a bit of control. Much more to be said about this, of course. I will throw in one interesting point, which is a very, you could say, human touch in the relationship, so far as we know, of the Ents and the Entwives. There's the song, of course, the poem, which is its own, oh. you know, lovely little bit I, of... I love that poem. I love yeah. it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an underrated one, I think, in, uh, in, in, Tolkien's, uh, in Tolkien's collection, because you, the more famous punchy ones are, are the ones that tend to, that tend to last. Um, and, you know, we even have a tiny bit of the poem in the films, you know, it was just uh, in the extended cut. Uh, is uh, is where it appears, but it's only a small bit because there you go. But um, this the other thing I will note is that he uh, is that Treebeard talks about. I cannot remember her name, I believe, but I believe he names his partner Finbrithil. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Wandlim. He talks about a. He talks about the last time he saw her, and he does so from the perspective of someone who is an older partner to someone else who's similarly grown older. And he talks about how you know, just you know, the ble- you know the bleaching of her hair. How he describes it. You know, the sun has bleached it out, and you know things wrinkled. These are like you know the the impact of age in very human terms. Interestingly, rather than necessarily tree terms, but he talks about uh, you know looking into her eyes and basically seeing their youth, that sort of reflection there. And that's a very sweet, loving comment, I think, about that. About oh, I, always, I love that part so much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's very it is it is interesting that it is is about the eyes. It is about that thing that at once is makes them alien to other plants and yet also draws this other connection in. It's just fascinating. I'll throw in an interesting moment now, turning it into alien behavior, and that is thinking about more how other characters react to the ants. In general, one of my favorite sequences is a part where the ants completely ignore everybody. And that's when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when and that's when you have uh, after the Battle of Helm's Deep, everyone's riding out. They're going to go off and, you know, face Saruman and Aragorn and Theoden and Gandalf and all there and all that. And, you know, basically, again, eyes. Gimli's like, ah, look, eyes. And everyone's like, yeah, what are you talking about? Or, or Gilegolas, I think, sees the eyes. And Gimli's like, I don't want to see the eyes. What, what is going on here? And Let's then, not go closer. No closer. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh. And then all of a sudden, you know, Ants come striding over the fields, another ant comes out of the forest, and they have a conversation that's completely unintelligible, and they don't care about the yeah. party. They don't care about the Rohirrim. They don't care. I think that's just an interesting illustration for perspective. Sort of like, what the 
you know, buy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It is kind of an, uh, like a necessary uh, perspective to, to sort of add to all this, which is things that you think are of the utmost importance to someone else. It's but the 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 work of a moment, you know. There's also something interesting too about how this fits into T Tolkien's this fits into Tolkien's wider, I think, great tendency to introduce elements that are never followed up on because he doesn't have to mm -hmm. because it's not needed, but it fleshes things out. And so, on the one hand, there's the fact that you know what is Old Man Willow? Oh, yes. Is Old Man Willow a horn? Is Old Man Willow an ant that's transformed? Never explained. Of course, Old Man Willow comes from the self-contained little stories that, you know, that Tolkien wrote about Bombadil before Middle Earth really, uh, before Lord of the Rings era, Middle Earth really came together. So it is a transplanted character. But how does it fit within that? But the other part I like is the one bit right near the beginning where it's Sam and some of the cronies talking in the uh, talking to the Green Dragon. And one of them says something like, I saw a tree walking on the North Downs. And it's like, yeah, there's no tree on the North Downs. So you get the sense of what was that? And, you know, and, yeah. you know, you don't think of it now. It's more like when you first read, it, you're like, oh, odd little story. But then you read along, you're sort of like, was that an ant? Was that an ant? Was it an ant or a horn? That's where the ant wives went. Yeah, I, I have always. Yeah, I remember not catching that. I'm pretty sure I didn't catch that on the first read, like the first time I read it. And it was like maybe the second time I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> That's where they went. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, it gives a sense of the lost, I don't want to say lost empires, but lost, lost, lost place, lost time. The idea that the ants would wander through all these things. And again, it all ties into a bit of that oh, old man willow is repurposed and sort of like you sort of think, well, is it or isn't it? And again, and your point about age, too, like who's the oldest one around? I think one of the funniest comments offhandedly that uh, any ant gives is uh, when Treber is talking about, oh, yes, young Saruman. Young Saruman. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like going, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Which, like, when you think about it, like, Treebeard has been around, like, you know, he's been around he's for, seen it all. what, like 10,000 years probably at this point? I, you know, before, literally before there were years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. he has been there. And so, of course, you know, Saruman's been around for, uh, like, a couple thousand years of the Third Age. I love, this is just sort of a, a, an aside related to his age and young Saruman and all that, is that it's really, really funny to me in a meta way that the one time anybody thinks to ask where wizards come from, they ask the character who is old enough to know, but also has no idea and doesn't really care that much. Doesn't care. It's just like, I don't know, they came with the ships. I don't know. What, whatever. <laughs> Let's talk about some trees. Let me let me show you this great looking cherry tree I yeah love. you want some yeah. you want some water i don't know yeah it's it's so it's just so funny that like that's the closest we get to explanation is treatment going heck if i know right like oh, and <laughs> ships <laughs> I really like how we get, we do, while well, Treebeard is the ant for the most part, we do get one other ant that we get to spend a little time with, and that's Quickbeam. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Bregolay. My boy. He's a good, he's a good boy. Quickbeam is really fascinating. I, I made a very casual comment, and I'm not going to explain some deep analysis here, but I made a very casual comment in one broader Slack discussion that he was almost a character who could be theoretically coded as queer. I'm not going to defend that, but there is something different and unusual about him. And uh, I think it's partly just the fact that he seems that, that he, he's, he's younger. He, he acts more quickly. There's something about him that sort of like is also his uh, his his ability to laugh, I think, is just very interesting. That seemed to be unusual. He is in, in the old sense. He is gay. He's yeah, he's quick to laugh. He's happy. Mm -hmm. and the rest of the ants are just like, Burr. yeah, they're pretty <laughs> dour. They're a pretty dour bunch. Meanwhile, Quickbeam is just he just wants to live it up, man. He mm -hmm. loves. He, yeah. Is it doesn't he like he like stands for like five minutes or half an hour or something just looking at a tree like he just does that <laughs> he like no it's Treebeard that like stands under the water for a while never mind yeah like, but uh, mm -hmm. Quickbeam it's the the Rowan trees is yes. that yeah. it mm -hmm. and it's such a it's such a sweet there's a sweetness to to Quickbeam I think that's what it really yeah. is yeah yeah 
He is. He's so sweet. And and that makes the contrast with what we see in the battle or what we hear about it interesting. And yeah, just, just to get back to you know Jared's very good points about the sheer violence of the ends, I think that's yeah. really noticeable because I I think in the way in the book is set up is absolutely brilliant. Where you know the ends approach it and looks over it, and then Treebeard night live you know, light lies over Isengard, nice. and then we go yeah. away oh, for a oh. while, and you're just like, what's about to happen? <laughs> and, and then it all happens off screen. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I wouldn't want every book to do that, but I love that this book does that. And it's such a brilliant move because that's the last you see of it. And then the next you see is sort of like, okay, the characters are approaching. This mysterious fog appears. Everyone's like, man, what's going on? And then you come up. You're sort of like, wait, are things ruined? And then you're like, what the what? You know, again, in the movie, it's all like, you know, the sun's out. And it's more like, ah, ha, ha, like, you know, a little moment here. In, in the book, it's much more like surrounded by fumes, you know, things like this. You're approaching you know where this big ring fortification is it's all collapsed you're like what the and then you look over and you see those two jokers smoking their pipes going oh hi <laughs> you know and it just yeah. goes from there and then the and then and then the end start appearing and things like this but then their story about how just incredibly violent <laughs> the ants are yeah the, the pulling pulling it like pulling down parts of the wall at leisurely like like just just for fun after yeah. everything is over just like you know yeah exactly just like yeah i'm going to i'm going to just pull apart some rock because i can we keep circling around the the ants, uh weirdness and alienness and everything um part of what makes them so alien is their incredible strength mm. oh god that, yeah they, like they're just there's not that many of them, and they are able to completely destroy Isengard, except for Orthanc, within a night. Um, right. And it's I've always found it sort of chilling, that moment when, it's only in the book, it's not in the movies, you don't have time to explain it in the movies, mm. where it's before, I think it's before Entmoot, when, mm. or maybe it's right after it. Either way, Mary and Pippin are talking to Treebeard, and they're like, could you really do it? And Treebeard's like, have you heard of Trolls? We're stronger than trolls. Mm, mm. We were the originals. Like they're they're the they're the copy. There's, yeah, somebody says later that, uh, or maybe it's Treebeard says it. I don't know. My memory of this sequence is all confused because the chronology is weird. Anyway, says that trolls, you know, orcs are made in mockery of elves, and trolls are made in mockery of ants. But everybody knows about trolls, and nobody knows about ants. Just except, except as a story, which is really interesting. Like, yeah. That is the weird, like, I wonder at, if that was just a kind of tossed off line that he, that Tolkien didn't want to, like, delete or something because, mm. or maybe Morgoth just messed up really badly when he was making trolls because I don't, like, no description of a troll had ever, in, like, made me go, oh, yeah, like, clearly that's just an end that's been messed up real bad. Just occurred to me. The biggest thing about trolls is that they turn to stone, you know, the, yeah. when the sun shines and all that. Um, they are, if, if, if ants are the power of, of living nature, trolls are sterile dead nature mm -hmm. with everything that makes them unique, just stripped out. And now they're, they're weaker. They're still strong, but now they're just like, these these dead. Tree beats rock. Yeah. They're, they are just these, just like clods of dead earth essentially wandering around there's something too in the fact that what we have in the ants you know essential violence is meant to be an acceleration of a natural process how plants yeah. break down structures or rocks you know is something you know a rock can break apart or you know some you know get you get your weeds you get your weeds in a crack somewhere and the weeds keep growing eventually over time <laughs> the weeds will win <laughs> is what it is yeah. it, may take, it may take centuries but the weeds will win so i i think that uh you know that's kind of it's a very interesting imaginative leap what if you took that natural power and then concentrated it into a moment yeah. and, uh, mm -hmm. and into a single punch. And and I think there's also there's the interesting stereotype, I could say, of you speak softly and carry a big stick or you are the big stick. In the case oh, you of are the big stick. stick. <laughs> but uh, but uh, <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> what you also have is uh, this sense that, uh, you know, even though even though the ants can be loquacious in their own way, in their own slow way, you do get a sense the ants are just quite happy not saying much at all. And there is the mm -hmm. the idea of the character who doesn't have to say much, who is someone who is you mm -hmm. can someone you can 
rely on or at least get a sense of. But they're the ones who are, you know, this goes back to all the other points you've raised. They've observed a lot. They've taken it all in. They're not immediately reacting, but that doesn't mean they're not thinking about it. (laughs) And so when they do build up to thinking about it, we see what happens. And that, I would argue, is, strangely enough, a human trait or something that we see both in real life to certain degrees, but also in in fiction a lot. Um, The idea that, uh, you know, somebody is patient until they're pushed a little too far. And mm-hmm. yeah, and then we, we see what happens. And that's why to get back to quick beam, f- to move from quick beam being mis- very, very, you know, seemingly light and happy, even though he's lost many of his people to turning into this just absolute, you know, mad figure, the tree killer and almost catching Saruman <laughs> right at the foot of Orthanc. You know, it's one of those things that in another story, you know, the bits of Saruman would be what would be found when the, when the, when the Rohirrim and the Hobbits got there. It'd be like, oh, uh, we're done here. <laughs> you know, it's it's it's. it's it's that kind of thing. I am. I'm kind of sad about uh, not like I, I understand why that didn't happen. But gosh, would have loved to uh, have had, you know, l- allowed just quick beam to get his justice, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about the tree killer. Let's talk about the relationship of Saruman to the ants, because it was it was friendly. It was. Trevor talks about telling Saruman things that he would never have found out on his own. And she seems to resent that a lot, which I get. <laughs> <laughs> And then it goes sour, and it feels like Trivia doesn't understand what happened exactly. He's not really, he's not sure. Until the hobbits come and tell him a few things, he's like, this bad stuff is happening, and I don't, uh, uh," and he's not doing anything about it. And I don't, I don't really know why that is. And it's clearly, it's clearly Saruman doing it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have any reason not to act. He just doesn't act. And I don't know, I don't know, I think that, I don't have any firm thoughts about their specific alliance, relationship, friendship, whatever it may have been. But I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts about Ents and Saruman and Hmm. all that. I do. I do find it oddly plausible that Treebeard, who like because his understanding of other beings is I'm not saying he's like naive or anything, but his understanding, like his perspective is so different from other living beings, much less Saruman, who is not, who is neither elf nor man, nor hobbit, nor orc. Um, (laughs) To Treebeard, it would never occur to have a mind of metal and wheels. Right. (laughs) So it's, it's just such a like, what? Like when we all found out that Tom Cruise and um, uh, Katie Holmes were together, (laughs) <laughs> it was just such a like <laughs> interesting analogy. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> just throwing it back. I don't know why that came to mind, but it was like it's like what? <laughs> so you know, it's something like that. The I guess yeah, it does feel like like it's so shocking to him that he doesn't know how to deal with right. it. Maybe mm-hmm. he's, he's just like ah, and then waits and waits. And there's an interesting little extra element to be thrown into that, too, is that if I remember right, the way Gandalf tells it, Gandalf sees Treebeard uh, after he returns in Fangorn briefly before uh, before uh, Treebeard actually meets the hobbits. Mm-hmm. And, like, they pass by each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, they're like, oh, yeah, how you doing? It's like, wait a minute, isn't there something big going on right now? <laughs> you know, Gandalf seemed to be taking it rather casually. <laughs> but it also, he seemed to be a sense of things will happen at their own pace. And it does just bring into mind how unusual Fangorn is as a place. Maybe this isn't a spot to go into delving exactly how Tolkien deals with forests in general, because that's almost its own topic. But, uh, but you know, odd things happen in Fangorn. <laughs> uh, odd, uh, you know, Fangorn feels different. It, you know, he, he's very clear about the difference between Fangorn versus Lorien, for instance. He, he's very he doesn't he doesn't draw one to one comparisons down the line, but the two forests are described very differently and, you know, differently from Mirkwood again as well. What you have is a situation where um, where the where the where, where you not only have like Gandalf walking through and sort of like, OK, like powers are passing in the night almost during the day. Mm-hmm. But then you also have the very, very odd element of uh, what happens when uh, when there's that part before Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli actually go into the forest the night before 
and they see the strange figure, the the person leaning on a stick, and uh, they check later with Gandalf, was that you? And it's like, oh, no, that must have been Saruman. I'm like, well, if that was Saruman, he wasn't doing much. Was it? Yeah, was why that? was he doing? <laughs> yeah, was it even Saruman? Sometimes I wonder. It's just, as, again, it's one of those things that in Tolkien, I like it because it could be just a random dangling element, or it could be something more, and he doesn't bother to explain it. And I don't mind when he doesn't bother to explain things. And, you know, that, mm-hmm. you know, and again, that seems to fit in with with uh, with Treebeard and, and the Ents as well. There are things we don't know. <laughs> there are things that he is mm-hmm. he, he is not delving into as much. It's more like, again, as Jared pointed out, a character has suddenly been introduced. How do I deal with it? You know, mm-hmm. that happens all the time in Tolkien. He's sort of like, I've got a great idea. How do I make this fit? You know, in much the same way that Tolkien, uh, that Treebird, rather, is trying to make the hobbits fit into his cosmology. <laughs> uh, bringing up Lorien reminds me that Merry and Pip, if we're, you know, talking about people being dangerous and different powers and things like that moving, is that Merry and Pippin are like, well, we were warned yeah, not to come near Fangorn mm-hmm. because it was dangerous. Mm-hmm. And Treebeard's like, well, I would have said the same to you about the Florian mm. if you'd been here first. And I think that's just such a cool moment where it's like, just because everybody's on the same side. Mm-hmm doesn't mean that they're all safe for each other in the same way. We don't know, you know, there's always petty petty drama within different forest fandoms. Yeah, and not even not even <laughs> petty drama exactly. It's just that if Treebeard's on the first, you'd be like, the elves are not fans of visitors. You don't want to go that way. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just like to keep them safe from any mistakes, he probably would have been like, you know, just just go around. <laughs> just head to the Great River. Just just don't go yeah, I, I don't know. I just love that as a as a detail where the, the ends probably think of Galadriel in the same way that the hobbits think about. <laughs> Which, in fairness, she is like a force to be reckoned with. Like, oh, she is. And uh, we have a whole episode about that. Go back and listen. Yeah, we certainly do. <laughs> yes, yes. Go back and listen. And uh, and yeah, the comment about sides is uh, certainly very important because, of course, that's a key moment in both the dialogue and then later on in the movie. Um, uh, Burr, the idea that the hobbits are like, whose side are you on? I'm not really on anyone's side. Now, that changes mm-hmm. over the course of it. But again, he is mm-hmm. he is on the side of good insofar as he's not. Sauron affiliated <laughs> you know it's 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 something studied it's something different yeah he almost um some but one of them maybe not Treebeard mm. it goes a little a little weird when Gimli shows up with an axe yeah mm. and it's it's a kind of another little chilling moment where it's like don't uh, don't antagonize this don't don't pull the axe don't, yeah he may be on your side but he will kill you go go without fire for this one night y'all yeah. <laughs> like do not touch the living wood like. Just pick up the branches, don't. <laughs> <laughs> and and there is also the the fact that uh, that Treebeard is open about the idea that you know ints and maybe more especially horns can go bad, black horns, yeah. you know, yeah. rotten hearts. And that seems antithetical to the larger construction we're going on, and yet clearly he draws this distinction: would these, would these, uh, would these particular spirits be actually, you know, on quote unquote Sauron's side? I don't get the sense of that, but you do get a sense of like, you know, agencies operating on their own sphere. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it is what it is. It's um, they wouldn't be on Sauron's side, but they would still be bad. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a really nice nuance of being like, you know, yes, of course, uh, nature. Great. We love it. But as someone who grew up in Florida, you learn to respect (laughs) the ocean, you know, (laughs) it all it's beautiful and it's so fun. Oh, my God. But it'll, you know, it'll mess you up. And I, I really enjoy that. Like every living creature within Middle Earth uh, and beyond has to make a choice, you know, Mm -hmm. And I think I'll end my own contributions. I'm sort of half keeping on the time. I think we're we're we we've done a good chunk. Um, so if we want to uh, maybe look towards wrapping up here, um, my final thought is to maybe where where we end with the ends in Lord of the Rings, um, which is that interesting moment where we realize that uh, what we have been what we what we perceive as the ends as a you know thousands of years of memory they know what they're going to do and saruman has been trapped in the tower and they're going to keep an eye on him forever and ever and a day and then when they come visit him again 
he's gone. They let him go. <laughs> and, you know, and the idea is that, you know, that, uh, you know, Gandalf ascribes it to like, ah, Saruman had one last trick with his power of his voice. But I almost wonder if it's one of those things that's an interestingly weird lesson in, you know, is it forgiveness? Is it what happens when you're taken, when you're, you're deceived by somebody in forgiveness? There's some interesting nuance there that I don't quite have a, don't have a finger on. And I'm not trying to say Tolkien's trying to make a grand statement. It could be just as simple as, hey, Saruman had one last ace, ace up a sleeve. There you go. Right. But but mm-hmm. it is it is interesting too that we see that we see that they they have made that choice and yet at the same time we also get to see the transformation of what had been Isengard and we mm-hmm. we get the tree garth of Orthanc this new conception of space and place where the the truly alien spot in that is Orthanc itself this constructed yeah. tower and now it's yeah. in the center of this artificial lake and everything is turned into something else again something almost sculpted entwives like but not quite yeah, I was going to say <laughs> not quite so it's an interesting sort of nuance you know sort of like what is a possible future and what what can happen from there yeah the ends the ends are prison abolitionists I think I think that's what that means <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, somebody, I think Gandalf says, oh, it triggered something like he knew the soft spot in your heart was that you can't stand to see anything caged. Sure. Well, do either of you have sort of last thoughts, really, to uh, to to end this discussion for now on? I think I mentioned briefly in the introduction about um, them being sort of a representation of his environmentalism, his sort of like reflexive, like mm. anti any kind of progress because it, or well, you know, quote progress, unquote, mm-hmm. very right. heavy air quotes around progress here where he would happily see, I'm just, you know, kind of cherry picking from the, the story and that sort of thing. He would happily see a ton of things destroyed rather than see another tree cut down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know that that is necessarily a healthy view of environmental preservation and ecology and all that. But it's a little, to me, it's a little nice to have it there. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's definitely something that you could see transforming into something almost as horrible. Like you mentioned, Jared, the eco-fascism mm-hmm. thing, which we should definitely talk about at some point um, mm. in, in depth. Because there is an, I don't know if you guys saw this going around on Twitter, but it was um, it was a, a like a, a fictional website for like an outdoor apparel store. Mm. Um, called Hours. And it was Mm. essentially like, here's how outdoor brands and uh, their supporters could very well use conservation as, uh, you know, as a platform for eco-fascism, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, you can, like, it's one of those things where I, you know, I live in New York City right now. I'm moving to Los Angeles soon. Like, yeah, you are. Mm-hmm. Woo! But also, oh no, it's horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> just wildfires all the time now, and you know, so all all I like the last few months, all I've ever, all I've wanted was a. a a quiet place in the woods to go look. And my fiance and I went camping a, f- a couple weeks ago. And even there, we couldn't find a quiet, a nice quiet spot. And it's just the sense of just vanishing opportunities to commune with nature. So I totally see the appeal on a surface mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. I totally see it. Even though ecofascism is bad. Yeah. Yeah. No, don't do it. Don't do don't it. Don't do it. But I, I, get the visceral desire yeah it's so weird like it's so weird to be reading the parts with the ends in again in 2020 middle of a climate change induced heat wave and go like well, i mean i w- i wouldn't but i i would like some more trees I, like i i, <laughs> I get why i just like sympathy but lot like I, I i love imagining nature reclaiming a lot of these ugly horrible glassy monstrosities that are you know 30 stories of glass and i hate them all <laughs> yeah and this the appeal of seeing nature rise up against something that i individually can't take down yeah mm. yeah the you know the the global capitalist system and what, uh, not to turn this into like a revolutionizing podcast <laughs> but you know why not but yes it's not a solution i would take but like i'm watching the world around me dry up and catch fire and going i don't like i can't be too mad at the guy for his just reflexive anger because <laughs> it may be a lack of nuance there but also <laughs> 
Right. Uh, it's it's yeah, fun so. to imagine. I, I take great solace in imagining the, the cleansing of Isengard. Yeah, I don't I don't have a complete thought about that exactly. It's just I think, yeah, there's this environmentalism that is active rather than despairing is or and one that doesn't rely on consumerism. Yeah, yeah. Let's just smash <laughs> just smash, smash it everything. all uh, again not condoning that but i it's so appealing at this particular moment in time yeah we're like it's a, a it's a revolutionary year in a way and yeah this is a form of revolution so yeah, well if if you want to phrase it in that way maybe one of the more telling interesting moments then of the whole end story especially with saruman is when they try to destroy or think they can't mm-hmm. the saruman laughs at them and that changes their mood from oh then we'll take care of it this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then the anger turns ice cold. And that is, yeah, that is very interesting. Maybe one last thing. I will say this. However, alien the ants are, apparently they make some good brew and it causes hobbits to yes, grow. Yes, the ant drafts. Did you, did you guys look up recipes for ant drafts? Because I did. I didn't make any, but I saw them. I should have. They sounded really good. They sounded so good. <laughs> but do they work? <laughs> All right, well, I'm willing to see. <laughs> right? Let's try them all and see. Uh, but I will say, now that I think about it, maybe this is maybe this is my last thought. You know, it's a quiet bit of magic. Not merely that it causes it to grow, but remember, he casts his, you know, pours things out, and he sort of puts his hands over them, and they glow a bit. And it's mm-hmm. never explained. It's just this nice little quiet touch. You know, the, this almost ties in back to Jared's, you know, the episode we did on magic that we did last year. You know, how magic functions work. Sometimes it's very, very small. And maybe maybe that's as much a story of the ants as anything else. It's a it's a subtle magic. The magic of nature. Okay, so we now look ahead to the next episode and the next topic. The choice of topic has come back around to me. So what will we talk about this time? So the last couple of topics, uh, ones I've been looking at, have not been really centered on Tolkien's work itself. It's either been ripoffs, adaptations, or something Tolkien has done uh, to decide it's not Middle Earth. So let's take it back to Middle Earth and specifically Lord of the Rings, but as kind of a framing, because what I'd like to talk about is not family, per se, although this will inform it, because I think familial relations in Tolkien's work, um, especially informed by the fact of how he grew up after a few years, an orphan and one who barely remembered his father is very, very interesting. But I'd like to frame it within a particular lens because it allows us to talk about three interesting, very interrelated characters and how Tolkien does and doesn't talk about them and their respective fates. And it's the most... I don't want to say it's the most central such relationship in his work. I don't think it is. But I think it's one that's played out on a very interesting level, precisely because it's a very human level, as opposed to, say, uh, one that's a father and sons of, uh, of uh, or a family of elves or even dwarves or things like that, or even hobbits. Because we can talk about family in the framing of, you know, Bilbo and Frodo, how they're both essentially orphans, their particular relationship. And that's worth studying, you know, father figures, how Gandalf functions uh, for them both in some respects as a bit of a father figure and guidance, there's much more to be said. But I'd like to use family as the framing to talk about the relationships and to talk about the characters of three of collectively some of the most interesting characters in Tolkien because they're all, they're related, but they're all very different. And when the tensions are playing out between them all, even if indirectly, ooh, it's big. So it's time to talk about Denethor, Boromir, and Faramir Ooh. as a family unit, as a team, how how they are individually, how they who they represent, the st- force of the state, <laughs> the uh, the, uh, <laughs> the incarnation of as close to a royal family, even though it isn't what they represent, how they look at the world, how they act. That's what I like to sort of frame about, because Tolkien is clearly very interested in this topic. <laughs> this is mm-hmm. something that, you know, he is looking at the one society of men. Men on a broad level as it plays out. And we were talking about empire and we were talking about how empire functions. And you could argue, uh, thanks to our insurance, the topic last time. And so how do these three representatives of a seemingly dying, if not dead empire, face what could be the end? Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of, and, but how do they do that as family members as well? What happens mm-hmm. there? So that's kind of what it is. So it's a, a bit of a blended topic, but that's what I'd like to sort of focus on. And we can bring in ideas of family and other things into that from all across Tolkien is the idea, but I want to see how it plays out here. Love this. 
All right. Great. So excited. Talk about the boys. Yeah. The boys. <laughs> My boys. <laughs> yes. Because, yeah, no, I, I think it's just good to talk about them. It's hard. To, it's not that you can't talk about them individually, but I think talking about them in this fashion is more. Yeah. Is more mm-hmm. interesting, I think, and I think will lead us to down different, down different, very different roads. So there's with that. So there you go. Well, that being the case, uh, thank you all as always for listening. We hope you come back next time, uh, as always for that. And uh, till we'll just keep on keeping on, and we aim not to roast in the meantime, whether for fires or other things. So <laughs> life, life, and yeah. When are you? It's October is going to be when you're uh, when you're making the move to LA. Is that it, Ariana? Yeah, um, like the, the second second week of October ish. So uh, we will record. We've got one. I'm. We'll be recording one more when I'm here in New York, and then subsequently I will be in Pacific on Pacific time. Yeah. Oh my right. God. <laughs> <laughs> that's where. That's where. And that'll be your choice of topic too. So you can start. Basically, you're, you're, I can already predict you can. Your choice of topic can be the West. Thank you. Thank you very yep. much. Thank there you. we go. <laughs> 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 oh, well, whatever it turns out to be. So, uh, as always, we uh, thank you very much for listening. We'll come back to you next time. Uh, our contact information is always in the end notes there. Uh, until we talk to you all next month, we'll see ya. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarie. Namarie.